his name on the back. Uh, and inshallah, he's going to be speaking about love for family and friends. And this is day two of Islam, we're in this week 2015 in Grand University. Um, just to give you some background, uh, Brother Samir, I like to call him Sheikh Samir, but he doesn't want to, <laughs> he's not going to allow me to do so. But uh, he, can, he has been conducting a Friday prayer drum in the public schools for the, the numerous years. I was one of the people that was sitting in Arafat and some of these. Uh, some this Friday prayer, so alhamdulillah is a great opportunity for me to pay the pay it back, you know. Um, also, right now currently he's doing halakhat for sisters and brothers as well at uh, Mac Learning Center in Riverside. And just some insight on his personal life, he's married a long Vatic and he has three kids. You know, love us, inshallah. Um, before we jump into the program, we were just wondering, inshallah, we're going to be passing by um, donation box. So if any of you guys have any spare change on you guys, donate whatever you guys can. It's going to benefit us, inshallah. Please raise your hand if you're non Muslim. So, inshallah, I promise that I'll translate anything I say in Arabic. And if any non Muslims come, inshallah, I'll uh, translate it uh, and I'll, I'll explain what I, I'm talking about. And subhanAllah, when I got this topic, it was a little difficult, right? Especially, there's so many things and so many directions that you can take this. And not only did you guys give me the topic of love and family, but you gave me love of family and friends. So each one of those needs a whole day. And subhanAllah, when you look at it, it's, it's something that's, so many people don't really understand in Islam. And it's very taboo with some people. And subhanAllah, when you look at love in general, and you talk about Islam, people are like, uh, are we even allowed to talk about that? Like, if you say, I want to talk about love to your mom or your dad, they'll smack you across the face and send you home. Or to your room. Right? And subhanAllah, when you look at this, Islam is something, love is something natural. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in our hearts. And where it comes is that, you know, what are we doing with that, with that love? And when it comes to love of families, you, we need to understand the definition of family in Islam. So what is the definition of family in Islam? And sorry, I'm going to go off topic because I thought there would be non-Muslims here, but since there isn't, I'm going to go off topic a, a bit. So what is family in Islam? A lot of people look at family in Islam or family in general as, you know what, I like a guy or I like a girl, we get married, we have kids and we live our life. In Islam, you couldn't be more wrong. In Islam, when you're looking at family and when you're looking at building a family, you're building a society a community. When you're looking at a family, it's a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a support system that you're creating towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not just having kids and, and, uh, and finding someone that you love and spend the rest of your time with and that's it, and then nothing else happens after that. But it's, a, it's the essence of a community. It's the essence of society. And we have families to ensure that, to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because each family is a building block of the society. And if, if our families are weak, in turn society is weak. And if our families are strong, society will be strong. And subhanAllah, when you look at it from an even bigger perspective is that when you have a strong family, everything that comes out of that family is so much stronger. Strong families means strong offspring and, and strong uh, fruits and children. Means strong moral characters. Means strong entities. Means strong character that's being built inside that household. And this is what Islam and how Islam really looks at, at families. That you're not a family and isolated in one corner and that you do nothing. No, but you're a family that comes together that is always stronger. And as Muslims, subhanAllah, when you look at a lot of things, we're failing at a lot of different things. 
Would you say so? Yeah? And we're struggling on a lot of different things. But the only safe haven that we have is our families. And the stronger they are, the better they are. Because so many times we get influenced by so many things. And there's three types, three main types of things that influence your mind and influence who you are and influence your character. School, because of the education system, what you go through, what they teach you, you start building ideas. The media, so television, internet, you name it, it tells you what to think, it tells you what to like, it tells you what not to like. And so many people start reacting to that as if, you know what, that's what I want, that's how I'm thinking. And the other one is your family. And subhanAllah, all of those people might think and sit there and think, you know what, yes, media and school, they're, they're, they're out there. And they're the ones that everyone goes to. Everyone's on Facebook, everyone's on Twitter, everyone's on, on Instagram, everyone's connected online. But just because it's the easiest outlet that's there doesn't mean that it's the one that leaves the, the strongest effect on people. But the strongest effect on people is what you do with your families and the lessons that you learn from your families. And many of us probably have heard stories and, and, and uh, lessons and, uh, and things from, from people that, you know what, they, were, they became so bad but because their families were strong, they ended up coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because their roots were strong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them and brought them back to, to His fold. But that only happens when we have strong families. And we have strong families when there's love in those families. And the Prophet والسلام, said, خيركم خيركم That the best of you are the best to their families. That's who the best of you is. That when the way you treat your family, the way you interact with your family, the way you help your family, that's what makes you the best. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to pra praise the prophets and the prophets before the Prophet وَالسَّلَامَ that we have sent to you prophets from be before you, how did he praise them? Did he say they were great men? No. That we have made for them like spouses and offspring. That he praised them by their families. And the Prophet ﷺ was the best example towards his family. And having that love between one another inside the family, between a husband and, and wife, and having children grow up in that kind of household is really what makes it strong. And what makes Islam so great? And when you look at examples of the Prophet ﷺ, the first thing whenever he was in trouble, or he was felt scared, or he felt like his life was threatened, the first place he ran to was his wife, his family. When the Prophet ﷺ received his message, can I stand up? Is that okay? When the Prophet ﷺ received his message, and the message of Islam, he got really scared. And he thought that, you know what, a jinn or something might have touched him. You know how you, you get scared, like, oh my God, something must be wrong with me, I, I better go to a shaykh and uh, somebody read Quran on me before something happens. Well, the Prophet ﷺ was so scared that he ran down the mountain in the pitch black of the night, and when he ran, he ran, ran to his wife. And the first thing that she did was comfort him. And he told her, you know what, there's something wrong with you. And she goes, la wallahi. She goes, no, Allah won't do that to you. Why wouldn't he do that to you? Innaka la rahim. Allah won't hurt you. You can't be hurt. Because you're good to your family. And that you're good to people, your neighbors, the people around you. And that you feed the people who are poor. And you help those that can't help and support themselves. This is how she comforted him. This is what love in Islam means. That's why when the people talk about love in Islam, we shouldn't be shy about it. The Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet of over 2 billion people worldwide, 
died in the chest of his wife. Two billion people followed the Prophet ﷺ and a great man that led and taught and revealed and received revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his whole life sacrifice, his last breath was taken on the chest of his wife. And this is why we're here today. Because these strong family ties is what keeps us strong, what keeps us great. And inshallah, what we'll do is we'll go through a lot of these stories. A lot of this love that was between the Prophet and, and his wives. And when you look at the love of his life, Khadija, and I want to say love of his life, because she was. Khadija, our mother Khadija, his wife, was the love of the Prophet Sam's life. That whenever, whatever he, whatever he did, he wanted to stay close to Khadija. And even after her death, he stayed loyal to her. That one day he heard a knock at the door, someone knocking. And when he was not, when the, he heard that knock, he goes, it sounds familiar, I hope it's Hala. I hope it's Hala. Hala is who? Khadija's sister. From how much he loved it, he jumped out. The Aisha said he was sitting down, he jumped off of, uh, up and ran to the door. As if to meet someone Allah lost love and he loved Khadija so much that he wanted to spend time with her family, with people that were like her. Whenever he started a slaughtered sheep or a goat and he wanted to give it to anyone, he'd say, please make sure that you give this to Khadija's friends and family. Because this is how much he loved her. During Fath Mecca, everyone knows who what Fath Mecca is, right? Who doesn't know? So Fath Mecca is when the Muslims were victorious in Mecca. So when they came into Mecca and the keys of Mecca were for the Prophet ﷺ, they walked in. And imagine you're, you're coming into a city that you just took over. And you're the leader of that army that came and they didn't even have to fight for it. They gave up the keys, he walked in. And imagine everyone greeting you and telling you welcome and sorry and forgive us and this is what we're going to do. One old lady comes by and he sees her, they run, he runs to her and he sits with her on the floor. And he spends an hour with people waiting for him. And when Aisha, his wife, saw that, he's like, what are you doing? Who is that? That you'd leave all these people on this day to go and talk to her. He said, that lady is Khadija's friend. He goes, so what were you talking about for so long? He goes, remembering the beautiful day. The days I spent with Khadija. The days we spent with Khadija. SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ, he loved her so much that I want you to imagine even 10 years after her death and many years after her death. After one of the battles, the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, they had some, some prisoners. And they said that, you know what, whoever wants to ransom their prisoners, pay money and take the take their fa uh, take their husbands and they can, or their family members and they can go back. One of the members of the the prisoners was the Prophet Sam's son-in-law, his own son-in-law, and Zainab, his daughter. At that time, it wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, it was still okay to be married to to non-Muslim. And he, she sent his ransom. And when the Prophet ﷺ received it and opened it, he started to cry. Because when he opened it, he found that it was a necklace. He goes, this is the necklace of Khadija. This is the necklace of the one I love. And they said that there were tears in his eyes. And he told, asked the companions, you know what, like, can we free him and give, give her back this necklace? And they were all so shocked by that love that he had for Khadija that they said yes, and they were all in tears. And when he sent it back with him, he said, take this necklace and tell Zainab not to let go of Khadija's necklace. Many years after her death, he still remembered her necklace. Some guys probably can't wait till their wives die to get married again. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> you hear the stories. And the wife probably the exact same thing, you know, <laughs> maybe get out of here and maybe I can get married again. Or how many people after the death of their wife by a few years end up getting married and forget who they were with? But love in Islam lasts forever. Because it's a love that's connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a love that has a purpose. Live your life with a purpose. Live your life with love and the love that connects you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After Khadija died, the Prophet ﷺ married our mother Aisha. And that's a whole new love story in itself. That even the companions themselves, whenever they referred to her, to Aisha, they would refer to her, her as Habib al Rasulullah, the love of the Prophet. ﷺ. And when you look at books of hadith, there's some books of hadith that when they're talking about Aisha and they're, they're narrating, you know the narration when you're saying that this person said this, said this from the Prophet ﷺ, some of the narrations they actually write حَدَّفَتْنِ حَبِيبَ حَبِيبُ الله. That the love of the love of Allah talked and told us. The one that the Prophet ﷺ loves told us this thing, this thing. This is how much the companions themselves, that people outside of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi own house knew how much he loved her, how much he felt for her. That they would say, like, Habibat Habibullah. This is the love that they had for one another. To the degree that one of the companions, Anas, he grew up and he, he, he grew up in Medina and he goes, the first love we ever knew in Islam was the love of the Prophet to Adaif. Was That was the first love we've seen in Islam. And Anas was born and raised in Medina, he never knew Khadija. He was a young boy yet when Khadija was, was alive. He didn't know the love that existed between the Prophet and Khadija, but from how much the Prophet loved Aisha, he said that this was the love that we found. This was the love that we knew. And subhanAllah, so many people, they sit there and they look at love and examples of love uh, as Romeo and Juliet and all of these great people, these great love stories and all oh, this was such a good, feel good love story. But we miss the point. Romeo and Juliet were never together. Yeah, they loved one another from a distance. Yeah, they loved one another when they, when they were easy going, but imagine they got married. They probably would have yelled at each other and threw each other off the balcony. How many love stories do you know that, you know what, so many people that are madly in love and madly love one another and went through hell and back just to get married. And three, four years pass and, they, and they're divorced. Because love that's based on love and just beauty and just the emotions means nothing. Won't last. But love that's connected, that, that you have that feelings for one another and you connect it to a goal and you connect it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the love that lasts. That's the love that means something. That's the love that has a purpose. Amr ibn As, one of the companions of the Prophet and his friends, he felt like the Prophet was going to be, was so happy with him that he asked him, you know what, who do you love the most? And he felt like I was going to say me, you know, like he's so proud of me, he loves me so much, he's going to say me. And he goes, Aisha, my wife, in front of his friends, he's saying, who do you love the most? He goes, my wife. And so Amr ibn al was like, okay, you know what, I'm not asking about the ladies, you know, about the men. Who do you like the most about the men? And he goes, her dad. He goes, okay, her dad we know has a special place in your heart, who's next? And he goes, oh, and he started to get disappointed, you know, like, I thought I was up there. He goes, you know what, I'm not going to ask you anymore, I'll just assume I'm the next one in line. But the Prophet ﷺ wasn't ashamed of saying, you know what, the person that I love the most is my wife. This is the type of love that they had. 
When I share, many times you'll find people that will come and they'll say, how much do you love? Let's get out of here, man. Just... No, 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 seriously, how much do you love? Just get out of here, lost. Just get out of here. Do you listen to what you want. Aisha asked the Prophet How's your love for me? How much do you love me? It's like a knot in a rope. That's how strong my love is. As strong as a knot that's in a rope. And every now and then she'd come back and she'd ask him, كيف حال الله يا رسول الله? How's that not, يا رسول الله? And he would say, it's still as strong as it was the last time he asked. This is the type of love they made. The Prophet ﷺ, A lot of people would get jealous from his wife. And even Fatima, his daughter, would get jealous sometimes. And she would sit there and ask. And she would sit there and talk to him about, about Aish, about his wife. And he would tell her, do you love me? He would tell his daughter, do you love me? She says, yes. She would ask him, do you love who I love? He goes, yes. He goes, then love that lady. Then love my love. That's how much the Prophet Sam loved her. Show her affection like in time that she was feeling tired and feeling, you know, like just doesn't want to be around him. To the degree that, you know what, when she was going through her menstrual cycle, if she drank from a cup of water, he would look and see where her lips touch in front of him and put his lips on the same spot and drink from that cool water. Whenever Eid came and Eid is the day that we set a day of celebration for us, he would take her out. And she goes, there were kids that were playing in the mosque and they were just sitting there playing. And I never saw what they did, what they did, and I wanted to see. And I told the Prophet, let me go and see, let me sit with them, let, let, let's go see. And he took her with them and he goes, here, take a look, look at what they're playing, look at the game they're playing. And she goes, the whole time we were watching them play this game, I had my chin on the Prophet's shoulder. His cheek stuck to my cheek. The whole time we were And whenever he sat there, I would, I would, he would sit there and ask, are you done yet? And I would say no. And it wasn't because I wanted to watch more, but because I wanted my cheek to stay on the prophet's cheek. And it wasn't until she got bored that she told him, okay, let's go. He would sit there and play with his wife and enjoy the time that he had with her. To the degree that they would run and he, they would be walking in the, in the streets and then he'd say, you know what, let's race. And they would race. And then his wife Aisha would beat him. And then he felt bad because she beat him. So a couple of weeks later, she goes, he asked me to race her again. He, he asked me to race me again. And they raced. And the Prophet Sam beat her this time. And he told her, you know why I've been feeding you for the past week? It's just so I can win, win this race. But this is the type of joy, this is the type of love that we have to bring back to our family. This is the type of love that we have to have just to connect with one another. He would never call his wife by her first name. He would always ask, call her by Aish. And I know it doesn't sound very romantic, but back then apparently it was. 
it's like a nickname that you give someone, like Teddy Bear or, you know, Magida Mags or, you know, things like that. But that's the way it was. He never called her by Aisha. He would always call her Ya'ash. And that was his, like, pampering name for her. But that's how the love was between them. And a lot of people might be asking, you know what, was it always rosy times? Was it always nice times like this? But even how, how do you treat each other when, when things are, times are tough? When you're not getting along with one another? When one of you does something wrong? How do you get along? What do you do? And the Prophet ﷺ teaches us that, you know what, that love has to stay there. To the degree that even like, Aisha's wife got really jealous one day. And she got so, so jealous that his friends were over and she grabbed the plate and she threw it on the floor. That's how jealous she got. And it broke. She got jealous and it broke. Now imagine that happened at home in your house. Your dad has all of his friends over and your mom throws a tantrum and just smacks the right on the floor and it shatters in front of everyone. Just imagine the scene. The Prophet Ali Sultan turns to his friends and says, it's okay. Your mother was a little bit jealous. And she's fine. And minutes later after everyone's gone, she goes back to the Prophet and asks him to forgive her for, for what she's done. But that's what relationships are. It's not always going to be smooth sailing. But it's how do we deal with one another. That when you have that goal and that vision of what you want your family to be, of what the strength between your family, then you know what? All these little things become so much easier. People get divorced over little, even more little things than that. Well, I don't know I like the way he looks anymore. Oh, he doesn't laugh and make me laugh like the way he used to. It's because that's what, it, that marriage was based on that. But in Islam, our marriages are based on connection with Allah's power and And that's why that love flourished. Because there's a purpose in it. There's a message behind it. The Prophet ﷺ used to know when his wife was upset. And a lot of us, we see our parents and we, if you're married, you see your spouses and you can tell when someone's upset. And the Prophet would go to him, would go to his wife and he goes, you know what, I know when you're upset with me and I know when you're happy with me. Like, how do you know? He goes, because when you're happy with me, you swear by my name. You say, Warabbi Muhammad. By the Lord of Muhammad. And when you're not happy with me, you swear by Ibrahim. Warabbi Ibrahim. By the Lord of Ibrahim. That's how he knew she was upset with him or happy. And she would say, after he told her that, she goes, but the only thing that would leave my heart is your name. But you are still there. And that was his, her response to him. One time they were, they were fighting. They had an argument. Just like any other couple would have in their argument. And so she goes, you know what? Let's bring someone to, make, to judge between us and tell us who's right and who's wrong. And so the Prophet says one of his friends. She goes, no, he loves you too much. He's going to stand beside you and he's going to support you. No, 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 I don't accept it. He goes, then who do you want? She goes, my dad. Bring my dad. My dad's going to stand beside me. So he goes, your dad? Fine, bring your dad. Bring him on. And he brings her dad, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and he tells her, and he tells Abu Bakr, and she, you know, do you want to tell him or do you want me to tell him? She goes, go ahead, but only tell him the truth. 
Only tell him the truth. And Abu Bakr, like, this is a prophet. He, like, he, he's yelling at his daughter. How can you tell him to tell the truth? He's a prophet. You know, does he say anything but the truth? And he wanted to, he was so like upset that he wanted to try and, and grab her and attack her and hit her or do something and the prophets like stood between him and her and he's like, you know what, like we didn't bring you to do this. Like, like you know what, we're good. Just uh, thank you very much. We don't need a judge anymore. And after he left, the prophet turns to his wife and nudges her and goes, see how I protected you from your dad? <laughs> and they started laughing. And her dad heard the laughing outside and knocked on the door and he goes, like you put me in the middle of your fight, let me be part of your laughter as well. But this was the type of families that they had. This was the type of connections that they had. Tell us so many people like they underestimate the value of women and the value of families and the value, the value that that they had and that strong connection that they had. That many years after the death of the Prophet a few people came together and they said, there's, there's two things, there's three things that will ruin your prayer. Three things that will ruin your prayer. If a dog touches you, if a mule touches you, and if a woman touches you. And Aisha, her mother, was still alive at that time. And she jumped up and she goes, you're comparing us to mules and dogs? She goes, the Prophet, when we were in our house and our houses were small, whenever he would pray, my legs would be out in front of him. And when he would bow down on the ground, he would poke me to move him, and then he would pray and put his head on the ground, and when he would stand up, I would put my legs back. This was the message, this was the love that they had. Don't let people ruin what you are, your, the understanding that you have of Islam. When you look at something, try and get down to really what Islam is. Don't judge it by by what people say, by what you hear on the news, but what you see on the internet. Judge Islam for what Islam really is. I had a lady come to me and ask me, you know what? I'm pregnant and I'm breastfeeding my child. Is it right or wrong? Like, why would it be wrong? She goes, I read it online. If you knew the amount of love that the Prophet showed to his family and his his wife, like these are their examples. Live them, live like them. Be like them. He would sit there. There was one time, you know how sometimes you get annoyed by other people talking? Sometimes, you know, husbands get really annoyed with their wives when they talk a lot in a long time and they're telling you this story. And they, they sit there and tell, okay, get to the, either get to the point or I don't want to hear it. Right? Or the other way around, you know, get to the point or I don't want to hear it. Well, in one of the books of Hadith, that those are the sayings of the Prophet and the sayings of, uh, of the companions, there's a one saying that if you read it, It'll take you over 15 minutes to read. And it's where Aisha, the Prophet's wife, is sitting there telling the Prophet a story. And she's telling him a story and she's going on and on and on and on and on and on. And honestly, like, I would probably get bored by <laughs> halfway through. But the Prophet stood there and listened to her. And she told him the story about 11 women that used to get together and complain about their husbands. And at the very, very end of the story, there was two couple that used to love each other so much. And after their, they got married and they lived a, such a happy life and everything was, was fine, something happened between them and they left each other. And after telling the story, the Prophet Isaac saw that his wife was affected, that she was feeling sad. 
And he goes, you know what? He goes, my love to you is as strong as those two couple. With one difference, I will never leave you. And she, it was like she was standing on cloud nine at that point. When the Prophet ﷺ came to die, when you look at a death of a Prophet, a man who today over two billion people follow in his footsteps, a man who received revelation from Allah, a man who many people followed and who, who had a message to carry and a responsibility, When he died, he died sleeping on the chest of his wife. And she goes that when he died, he was on my chest and I could feel that he died because his, his head became heavy on my chest and his arm fell from my head. The love between them that she would, you know, on his deathbed, she would take his toothbrush and they used to use like twigs what they call miswax. And because he was so weak, it would be a little hard. She would take it and, and make it a little softer with you and use it and then give it to her, to him. This is the love that they have for one another. This is the type of love that our families have to have, the strength that they have to have. And like I said before, the stronger the families, the stronger the society is. That's the whole purpose of families in Islam. It's not just to have kids, it's not to live your life and that's it, but it's to come together and create a, a block of society that works towards betterment of your community. The stronger the, the family, the stronger the community. The weaker the families, the weaker and the more problems the community will have. What we'll do is we'll take a break if there's a, anyone needs to go to the washroom or get anything to drink. And if there's any uh, questions or comments up to now, we'll take them. Thank you, Allah. We thank you. We seek his guidance, his forgiveness. And whomever Allah guides them to lead astray, whomever Allah leads astray, we'll get away. So those were just some examples of love, of love in Islam and love for your family. And I know that you guys have, I didn't go into a lot of detail because uh, I think Dr. Abdul Omar still has uh, love of prophets and uh, I mean, it's a whole week of theme of love and I don't want to ruin it for the other speakers. I guess that was lucky going first. But uh, just to give you like a little hint and a flavor of what love is in Islam. And that, like I said, it's not something that you should run away from. And it's not something that's wrong or haram but it's the way that you use it. And connecting it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like I said, it's all about having a strong society. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, when he went to Medina, and the Muslims were weak at the time, they, didn't, they just left a, a city that they were tortured in, a lot of their wealth was left there, a lot of things were left there, they had nothing that, was, that they took with them, they were just fleeing for the, their lives. The first thing that he did when they got to Medina was what? That he made brothers between the people of Medina and the people that were coming from Mecca. And he told them, you know what? This person is your brother. And that lady is your sister. And they felt it so much and they understood that, you know what? Because of that love, they needed to build that society, to build that community to the degree that they would come and they would tell each other, you know what, this is my house, I'm cutting it in half and you take one half and I take the other. This is my bank account, you take half of it and I'll, I'll take half. And this was the sense of community and this was how they built. And the people that were coming from Mecca were all tradesmen, all tradespeople. And the people of Medina were all farmers. So you're coming and you're trying to make a living, trying to make an income, but you don't know how. And by creating this brotherhood between them, they started to learn. 
and they started to get into that business and created their own markets. But this was only doable because the community and the families were strong and made the community that much stronger. And a lot of times, you know, we get very upset with our families, with our family members, the people. You know, some of them rub us off the wrong way. You know, our parents don't understand us. They don't like the way that we're acting. They don't approve of what we're doing. And so, so many of us, we sit there, we discard our parents and our families. But when you look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He refers to the Qur'an, He goes, وَقَدَ رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that you worship no one but Him. And when after He said, I decree that you worship nobody but Him, He goes, and be good to your parents. Right after. Just to show you how high of a standard that they are. And when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, you know what, who deserves my friendship the most? Who should I befriend the most? He said, your mother. And when they said, then who? He said, your mother. Then who? Your mother. Then who? Your dad. But this friendship is a friendship that gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because those ties of family need to be strong. The Prophet sought to Islam, his own uncle would grab garbage and throw it in front of his door. And he would just clean it up and do nothing. When he was kicked out of one of the cities and stoned and humiliated, the angels came down and said, you know what, if you want, we'll destroy them. And he said, no. Because maybe someone from them will turn out to be good. Many of the companions that were, were tortured, even people like Talha. One of the companions, his name was Talha. And he was known, he used to be very obedient to his mother. And then he became a Muslim. And his mom refused and hated it. You know what she did to him? She would chain him up and let slaves drag him through the market, beating him. And she's walking behind him, cursing him. And one man that was a stranger to the city says, like, what's going on? What's, like, what's happening? He told her he became a Muslim, she didn't like it, and that's what she's doing to him. Well, so why doesn't he do anything to her? Why doesn't he say anything back to her? And the man replies, because that's what his religion told him to do. To be kind to them. People like Musab, who is known to be like one of the, from the richest families, that his mom would pamper him. That you know how when he would only wear ex exported clothes, or imported clothes. You know how everyone runs to Louis Vuitton and Gucci and Armani and things like that? Well, he used to, Syria at the time was, was, was the Gucci and the Louis Vuitton of the time. And he would not wear anything unless it came from them. And he wore the most expensive perfume. That if he walked in, down the street and you were to walk like, Minutes later, you would know he passed by him. And when he became a Muslim, she trapped him in a room for three years, never seeing any of the companions, never seeing any of the, the Prophet or anyone. And not once did he refuse or say anything bad to him. Because this was the strength of a family, that the family ties, that being kind to one another is, is a must. It all comes back to the stronger you are as a family, the stronger society will. And I'll say it over and over again. The family is our last line of defense. Everything else can go wrong. 
But if we lose the strength of our families and the morals and the ethics that they carry and 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 re, and that and the lessons that we instill and that we learn from them, then really it means nothing. And friendship is a subsection of a family. The connections and the relationships that you have with your friends are part of that family. That's why the Prophet ﷺ made brothers and made them friends when they got together. <coughs> Friendship nowadays is based on three things. Either, <coughs> either friendships that, you know what, your friends are leading you down the wrong way. And you have friends that bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have friends that waver you back and forth. But the type of friendships that we want are the friendships that bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there's a scene in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that, you know what, there's going to come a day when you meet Allah that, you know what, you're going to be biting on your fingernails. And on your fingers, regretting the friends that you have because of the path they took you down. That they never reminded you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they never made you better. That they never got you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you look at the companions and the, and the Prophet and the friendships that they had and the love that they had for one another, it's unbelievable. To the degree that, you know what, the Prophet made every one of his friends feel, feel special. Now we said the story of Amr, that he felt that, you know what, the Prophet was going to say, I'm his, his uh, he loves me the most. And so many of them felt that way. And the stories go on and on and on. And Allah warns that, you know what, watch out who you befriend because the day comes when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's either going to be a great day or a really bad day for you. Depending on how that, that friendship took you and where that friendship took you. Friendships nowadays are based on, you know what, give and take. Are they going to benefit me or not? But friendships in Islam are about taking, about giving and not expecting anything in return. Helping and not expecting to be helped. Supporting and not expecting to be supported. genuine love for one another. And when you link those to the family that we, the strength of the families that we have, one strong family, one strong relationship, another strong family, and you link them together, we have a strong society. But sometimes we're just afraid to take it. Sometimes we're just afraid to take that step. Sometimes we're afraid of Islam. when we shouldn't be. So I know we were supposed to go to question and answer, but does anyone have any? <laughs> you guys didn't have any, so I thought I'd add that part in there. And I thought, you know what, like the family is the, is the biggest thing right now. And, and everyone has one. And sometimes you don't appreciate it until you lose it. And if there's anything you take from this, is go back home and make your family strong. And connect them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have a purpose behind your family. Have a purpose for you and your brothers and your sisters, for you and your parents, you and your future spouse or your spouse. 
and maybe when you guys are a little later in the uh, years, almost finished university, I'll come back and give you a, a lecture on marriage and children. <laughs> but if there's any questions or comments? Sure. Um, I know a girl who uh, her mom left her when she was in her house, and so she was raised by her dad and like, the rest of her family and and stuff. Um, and now her mom's like always following her and like um, she's like kind of crazy. She told her like she has cancer and she'll call her and be like my husband died and like just trying to get like attention from her and stuff. And she doesn't really know how to deal with those kind of situations, but she knows. Uh, and she like her dad remarried, so she has like a mom. But she doesn't know how to deal with your biological kids. Do you have any advice for her on that? No, I, like, I don't know. I, I it's hard to give an answer to something like that. Like, I think she should try and connect with her. Like, of course, like she's at the end of the day her biological mother. Like, so, and it's all about I mean, having relationships and and connecting with people. And I mean, like. I have to know more detail about the situation, but I think like she should make that effort, right? And you know, she knows that there's certain things that are in like that might be part of that. So that depends on how deeply involved she gets, right? So having those relationships doesn't mean you just jump in and that's it. Like you know, you you use common sense right, on how much you you get involved and how much you get there, but you never sever any ties. Remember when the prophet I saw Sam was asked. When he came to his wife, before he even they knew he was a prophet, before anything, she goes that no one will hurt him because he cannot, he's, he's good to his family. And at least that goodness comes from you. Uh, this is a two-part question. Is Sheikh Khalid Muki answered it yesterday, but there are some people that are telling me that they're going to say, let's say if there's a scenario going on between you. Or you and your family, and the person has to play, or there's whatever you know, going on, and you know, by you going up to them and just trying to rekindle that relationship, it might cause more more damage than that's good. Do you get bad leads from abstaining from that? What can you do? I mean, if you get into a fight, you need time for people to cool off, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you don't try later on. Like you don't have to try and fix the situation right there and then if you know everyone's heated and emotions are high and everyone's just yelling at each other. Use your common sense. You know, sometimes it takes calming down and uh, and then going back and talking about that. And in the absence of like let's say if you don't do it, you choose not to, would it be considered a sin? If you didn't, you just said I'm not, I don't want to uh... I don't answer those kind of questions. Like sin, sin or not sin questions, uh, I don't know. I don't have to know. I'm not a shaykh, just so everyone knows. Okay? That's why I don't pretend to be. Can you give some pointers in showing our family number of ways in which they can improve different ethnic, improve different ethnic backgrounds that approach their daughters or their sons who approach a girl from a different background? Oh, oh. <laughs> huh? That is a loaded question. So, can you give some uh, <laughs> pointers in showing our family members ways in which they can approve different ethnic backgrounds that approach their daughters and their sons who approach a girl from a different background? Yeah, that's a big problem in our community. Uh, but you know what? It's getting better, and sometimes it's uh, it's very difficult. And the thing is, is that do I have any pointers for you? I mean, other than talking to your parents and talking to your family and exposing them to other cultures and other other ethnicities, um, really, it's it's a it's an uphill battle with that kind of with that question. Um, I know it has to take somebody in the family to break the. <laughs> you know, break the mold before uh, a lot of other people do it. But you know, there's a lot of examples out there. And you know what, maybe showing your parents examples of that. You know, of like, look at how the, you know, diversity, the diversity that they have there, and, and look, it's working, and that they're happy, and, the, and they're, they're being positive, and they never left their families. I think the biggest problem with, with uh, that is culturally, our parents feel like 
if we go to a different culture or background, <laughs> that they're going to lose us. So I think the biggest thing is just reassuring them that, you know what, you're still going to be there. You're still going to be part of their family there. You're not going to be shipped off to a distant land and, and not be able to come. Everything is close now. And, and really, I don't have an answer to that. Like, there's no, no real pointers. It's, it's really comes to awareness and uh, making parents aware of the of different cultures that are out there, you know, different ethnicities, what the, you know, other marriages that are multicultural and how they're working. Kind of building up on that question yeah. as well. Um, <clears throat> I know of a friend of mine, and uh, she has parents who say that if she marries, like she's Arab, so if she marries anyone who isn't from like her country, even her specific tribe, I guess, then they will like drop her. So is but she wonders like how she's supposed to deal with like should I like cause she doesn't know she hasn't found anyone for her that is from her like. Uh, from her tribe or from like with her from her ethnicity, she's found someone who's outside of it, so she doesn't know whether to to go left for him or for her family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with that with that kind of situation, uh, like she should try and, and and resolve it with her parents. And a lot of times, parents throw empty threats, right, <laughs> or or speak just uh, very strongly. And I'll talk, my dad was the exact same thing, right? So my dad was like, you know what? You're not you're not marrying the Lebanese. You're not marrying someone from the Baya. You're marrying someone from the family, okay? <laughs> and our village is like this big back of Lebanon. He's like, you're marrying someone from the family. You go to check out your <laughs> people in the family and you marry one of them. And so when I told him the first time I wanted to marry an Egyptian, all hell broke loose, <laughs> right? And, and their biggest thing, they're like, my dad didn't talk to me for like seven months. But I still talked to him, I still interacted with him, I still asked about him. But it was like, hi, hi, and that was it. Mind you, I was in Ottawa back then, so it was a little easier. I wasn't like in, the, like in their face every day. But at the end, they started coming around, right? They, they say that because they want to protect you. They don't know who that person is. A lot of times, you know what, talking to the mom to kind of talk to the dad and to try and get to know them, you know, having a heart to heart really helps. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's misconceptions of, of the other ethnicity. So, for example, the reason that, so I found out the reason why my parents didn't want me to marry an Egyptian. So, <laughs> so the reason was is because they watch too many Egyptian TV shows. And the Egyptian ladies are always yelling at their husbands and uh, telling them off and things like this. So my mom didn't want me to have a wife that would tell me off and always be yelling at me. So I'm like, not all Egyptians are like the ones on TV. So, but alhamdulillah, yani, uh, it ended up working out for a bit, but subhanAllah, like, things didn't happen. And you know what I've learned? I've learned a very important lesson. That when Allah subhanahu wa wants it to happen, it will happen. And no matter how difficult things are, it will happen. And no matter how much you want something, but if it's not meant to happen, you can do whatever you want and it's not going to happen. This Egyptian girl, like, like I said, I fought with my parents, I, my dad didn't talk to me for seven months, things were going great after seven months, they started <coughs> talking, parents were talking, everything was going good, and then all of a sudden nothing happened. It broke off. Then I move back to Edmonton and I say, you know what, I'm just going to focus on school, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to work, and that's it. And then I was going to the mosque at Rashid on the north side, and I meet my wife. At the time she wasn't my wife. And I kind of, you know, was, uh, I'm like, people were telling me about her, I'm like, yeah, forget it, no, I'm, I'm not interested, I'm focused on school right now. So one day her brother, uh, she comes and asks me, you know what, do you want to organize, help me organize Islamic Awareness Week at Nate? Because uh, she knew I had experience from Ottawa, she wanted me to help her at Nate. So I said, okay. So that's when that motion started to work, right? So we started working together on uh, Islamic Awareness Week at Nate. And then I went home and I said, that's it, I'm done, that's it. Like, I'm not, I don't want to get married anymore. But before that, I was dying to get married. 
and it didn't work. There was a Libyan one, and then there was an Egyptian, and then... So I'm, I'm telling you, I tried so hard to get married. It just wouldn't work. And then subhanAllah, this happened, Islamic Awareness Week went, and then in the summer one day, the Shaykh at the Rashid, he called me, he goes, Samir, come here. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, you know what? I think you should get married. And there's this amazing sister. And her name is Nada Handa. And I'm like, you know what, Shaykh? I, I'm really not interested. I want to focus on school and, and work right now. My dad's sick. I, I, I don't want to get married. So a couple of days later, I sit, I go and pray, and uh, they make a man to pray ask. And I go to the front line, and there's this old man there. And he calls me, he goes, come here. Like, okay. He's like, are you Sharif's son? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I know your dad. I'm like, excellent. <laughs> the young guy like that. I'm like, good. He's like, are you married? I'm like, no. Nope. He goes, you know what? I see her all the time. And I know this family, they're really good and they would fit perfectly with your family. And they have a daughter, her name is Nada Hanna. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I, I really don't want to get married right now and I'm focusing on school, but thanks for thinking of me. And like I said, and at the time when I was in university, I, wanted, I was working hard and I had the whole plan of how I was going to like make rent and I had this huge budget filled out. And now I was getting like more mature and I was like, you know what, I'm not ready to get married. There's no way I, have, I, I can get married at this time. And then one day I walked into the masjid and she was there. And that's when the spark started <laughs> going. <laughs> But like, really, like, you know what happened? So I saw her there, and I'm like, you know what, why not? And literally, I walked up to her and I said, can I talk to you for a minute? She goes, and, I, and after Islamic Awareness Week, we never talked at all. She goes, uh, what? I go, if I go ask your dad for your hand in marriage, would you say no? And she goes, she didn't say anything. So I said, okay. I left and I called her dad. Her dad calls me and tells me, okay, come on Wednesday. So I'm sweating bullets and my dad will not go. He goes, you have to go and ask. If he says yes, I'll go. But if he says no, you want him to say no to your dad? I'm like, okay, fine, I'll go. So I end up going. I ask, I, I want to get to know your daughter and, and, and marry her. He goes, okay. I got, so we started going over to her house. I got to know her for three, four days, then he called me, he goes, what's the plan? He goes, yeah, I'm interested. Within a month, we were married. And our actual wedding was a year later. Like, so in Islam, you have a, you have your contract, your nikah, right? So your nikah, your actual nikah is your contract that you're, you're officially married. Your ketbik dev is they call it in Lebanese, for Lebanese. So we did our nikah like a week, uh, almost like a month later. So we were officially married. But we didn't have the wedding ceremony until we, until we found the hall a year later. And her brothers were getting married, so we have to wait till that for them to get married and stuff. But I, you try so hard sometimes to get married to someone that you think is the right person and that you want. And when you find that there's a lot of obstacles in front of you and there's, you're unable to get over them, sometimes that's a sign. And sometimes, you know, the, when you least expect it, Allah just makes things happen. Allahu Akbar. Does that help? It's a nice story, but I like sharing that story. So, is it recorded? Because my wife says that I never mention her in anything good. But it's tough. Like you, if if they really love each other and they want to be together, then they should try and find a way to make the parents happy, right? And make sure that it's for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That's the first thing. I know a friend, he used to, uh, in university, he used to love this girl. And they used to, like, like he wasn't very practicing and she wasn't very practicing. And he liked her and he would hang out with her at school and things like this. And of course, this is, like, I mean, other, like, there has to be boundaries. And he started becoming more practicing. But he still liked the girl. 
And he told her, you know what, I really can't get, like, I'm in no condition to get married right now. And you know, us going out on the, like, uh, out like this, like, I can't do this anymore. And he goes, you know what, I'm going to give you my, like, uh, he, he, they, they, his sisters were friends, and he goes, you know what, stay in touch with my sister. And when I'm ready to get married, and if you're still interested, we'll get married. Three years later, they finish university. They get married, and they have five kids in them. That when you leave things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you make them happen the right way, things work out. My cousin married someone from Turkey. You know how hard that one was? <laughs> <laughs> That's even out of Arabia. But when, I, when it's meant to happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always makes it away. But don't try and force things that... Give things a good effort. But don't lose your ties and your family. How can you build a family on something that, on breaking another family? Especially if your family is strong. Okay. Any other questions before I take the one in front of me? Okay. Okay, so Islam teaches us to love and respect our parents, but what if one of them is truly living a negative lifestyle and it's difficult to relate to them with any advice? So, our parents at the end of the day, we need to respect our parents regardless, you know, whether they're leaving, leaving their life, life negatively or not. And we should always be there to support them and to try and be a positive influence on them. Sometimes you're going you're gonna to be able to do it, and sometimes you're not. But you never give up. And you always try your best to do it, to help them out. And subhanAllah, like, like I said, like Talha, his mom would curse him. His mom would beat him on the streets. And still he would listen to him. And wouldn't respond back to him. And so many other examples like this that, you know what, people deserted their own kids because they disagreed with their lifestyle. But because of the, the way that they dealt with them, because of the way they communicated with them, the way that they stood beside them, they'll feel it one day and they'll remember it one day. And hopefully be a more positive influence. And sometimes, you know what, sometimes we look at our parents as being very negative and that they're hard to relate to, sometimes we need to look in the mirror as well. And see, you know what, sometimes maybe it's us. Maybe I'm not giving them an opportunity to understand me. Maybe I'm not giving them an opportunity to listen to who, what I am. Because our life and our families right now have become, everyone's here, but everyone's on Facebook. Everyone's in the same room, but no one talks to each other. And sometimes, yeah, it is our parents, and they're old style, and they come from back home, and they have these messed up way of thinking. But what we do is different to them. And we have to work together to help them understand where we're coming from. And you understand where they come from. I know it's short, but I like to keep them short and sweet, not going to work. On that note, most of the girls know the guys are going to be shocked. I'm 47, so I'm going to give you a little piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing you can do, and it goes from parents to children as much as it goes the other way around, okay? Because my children are all probably almost your guys' age, is you have to have patience with your parents. Because we're so desperately, and that's the word for it, trying to protect you, we have blinders on. So if you guys can look at it and have patience with us from that side and realize we're not trying to hold you back, we're not trying to stop you from growing, we're just desperately trying to protect you. And if you can step back and see it through our eyes, 
that makes it easier for you guys to relate to us. And then as my children started getting into their 20s, getting to be your guys' age, that's where I then had to do the role reversal and go, okay, wait a second here, the young adults, and it takes your parents a while. And then of course the other thing I don't really understand is all the different cultural differences. Right, like when I'm hearing you say, I'm like, I don't get it. I'm, I seriously, I'm, I'm half Irish and I'm half Ukrainian, right? But we grew up in Canada, so it was easy to meld all of that. So I mean, I understand it, but I just can't relate to it, right? But that's, that's the biggest thing. Have patience with them. Try to see it through their eyes so you can understand where they're coming from. And the reason is then your arguments towards them can be better. Seriously. <laughs> it's, it's the best thing to do, right? Is look at it through their eyes, whether it's marriage or schooling or anything. Honest to God. And Paula, when you, now that you've mentioned it, like a lot of times, you know, we take things for granted. And it wasn't until after I got married and had kids that, and I know it's cliche, everyone says it, but truly you'll say it too. Uh, you know what, you actually realize what your parents were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And that they were trying to really do their best. And most of our parents, like, my parents came from back home, right? So this was a foreign land to them. They didn't know how the culture was, they didn't know the language very well. And they did the best that they can. And now my mom, like, because of how overprotective she was and she wouldn't let us go and mingle and interact with other people and this and that, she sits there and cries to me and she goes, I wish we let you guys go out more. I wish we let you guys see the world more. I wish we did this and I wish we did that. Sometimes it's just like she said, perspective. Be patient with them and, and talk to them. Okay, I'm getting the, the note now. But... Is it acceptable to lie to your parents because you are scared of hurting them? <laughs> so if you're flunking in school and they ask you how you're doing and you tell them, oh, I'm doing great until you get kicked out of the university, yeah, that doesn't fly. <laughs> SubhanAllah, you know what? Always tell the truth. You know, sometimes it'll hurt a little bit now, but if it hurts a little bit now, it's better than hurting a lot later. And subhanAllah, even one of the companions, you know, like, he, uh, he left, he, the, the, there was a big battle, and he was supposed to go and meet up with everyone. And he said, I was in the best state that I was in. I was healthy, I had the money, I didn't just have one car in the driveway, or a camel in the driveway, I had two. And I started making excuses for myself, I'll go, I'll meet up with them, I'll meet up with them. And the day would pass, and the day would pass, and the day would pass, and all of a sudden they were coming back. And all the hypocrites and the people that were just, you know, just saying things would go and lie and tell the Prophet that, you know what, oh, we were sick, and oh, we couldn't make it, and oh, our wife was sick, and oh, our kids were, were very sick, and this and that, and you know what, they just started making excuses. And he would say, you know what, okay, fine, go, go. And he said, I decided to tell the truth. And when he sat there, yeah, the Prophet was hurt by his, his, his honesty. I had no excuse not to be there. But at the end, the whole community boycotted him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them his forgiveness because of their truthfulness. A lie only leads to another lie, leads to another lie. And you end up in a web of lies and you don't know how to hide it. Because you don't know who you've told that lie and who you have in that web of lies. Just tell the truth. Yeah, they're going to be hurt, but at least man up to it, or lady up to it. They might be upset with you and hurt by with uh, with you for a bit, but they'll be more happy with you that they they can trust you, that you go to them, that you know what, that yeah, you know, even in the tough times, he's willing to come and tell me the truth. The reason I said the whole school thing because I know so many guys who get kicked out of university and they're telling their parents they're doing great. <laughs> so don't be getting kicked out of university, please. Okay, any other questions, comments? No? Yes? Hi, Sam. Are you Egyptian? <laughs> okay. 
That's okay. Um, wait, uh, I'm, I'm with you, Yanni. I don't think all of the children are like that. Yeah. Um, I had a question. Um, what are some of the ways in which we can increase the love uh, in our families? So what are some strategies or activities that you would suggest? So, the, and that's a very good question. And the first thing is that, you know what, when we're with your families, you know, put these away. You know, a lot of times, you know, we just miss that face-to-face -face conversation. You know, and a lot of times we've become so connected that, you know, like I said, you'd, we'd be, you'd be sitting there and everyone does it. You know, you go to your parents, your parents' house, your brothers and sisters are allowed, around, and everyone's on their own device and their own phone. You know, set up things for you to do with your family. You know, a lot of outings. You know, go, go out with your family. Organize a trip with your family. You know, a lot of times I know you don't like hanging around with your family, with your parents and your mom and dad. Hang out with them every now and then. You know, just talk. See how they're, how they're doing. You know, get to know them. Get closer to a lost count out of them. I came home from Ottawa one day when I started becoming practicing. The first thing my mom wanted to do was cut my beard off. And I had a little longer beard. Because to her, like, having, being practicing and having a beard was like, Oh my God, like, you're a terrorist, like, what, what's going on, like, this and that. And that's my own mom. And my mom is a very nice lady. Everyone that knows her, she's a very nice lady. Right? But all it took was just me talking to her. And telling her, yeah, like, I might look a little different, but I'm still the same guy. That, yeah, I still want to do well in school. That, yeah, I'm still ambitious and want to be the best that I could be. That, yeah, I'm still part of this family and can interact with you. That, yeah, I can still crack a joke and laugh at it. Talk to them. Go out with them. You know, organize these kind of things. Get closer to Allah Subhanahu with them. You know, sometimes all it takes is putting something on TV and not, not telling them come and always forcing them and pushing them. But sometimes just being available. You know, be there without being occupied with other things and give them that opportunity to come to you. You know, with your siblings, with your brothers and your sisters, a lot of people, they don't talk to their siblings, they have different circles, different things like that. You know, do something that they like. A lot of times we like to do and organize things that we like. But sacrifice, like, remember what I said, that it's our friendship is not taking but giving? Well, sometimes, you know what, to make sure that those relationships are strong, do things that they like. Do things that you know they'll enjoy. Even if you might not at the beginning. And maybe the next time you'll do something you love. Allah Allah. Yeah. Um, one last question. I thought I'd have to leave. But... <laughs> oh, okay. If you, want, if you want them to continue, you guys can leave. No. I had a question there. I don't know if you thought. I was basically just asking if you know any... Um, Stories of the Prophet and his relationship with companions. Yes. Like their kind of friendship. So tons. Yeah, you So, how many examples do you want? What type of examples? The best one. Huh? The best one. The best one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So, of the Prophet Ali Sallam specifically? No, just. Okay. So the companions used to love one another and have like immense respect for one another. To the degree that, you know what, when, when they used to ask Sayyidina Ali, and Sayyidina Ali was known to be a strong and wise man. And they used to ask him, you know what, who's the strongest of everyone here? And they were saying that, you know what, you must be the strongest. You're, you're, you're a strong guy, trying to beef him up. And he goes, no. The strongest was Abu Bakr. That when he saw that the Prophet was being ridiculed in Mecca, he was being in the, there was about 10 people around him, pushing him around and dragging him this way and pulling him that way and pushing him towards the other person. We all sat there scared of doing anything. And Abu Bakr was the weak and skinny one, jumped in the middle and said, you know what, how can you stand there and do nothing? And he jumped in and he pushed people off of the Prophet And they were so upset with him that they started to beat him up. And even some of them took off their slippers and sandals and started beating him on the face. 
until his face was swollen. They say you couldn't tell his features. And they thought he was going to die. And when they took him home, they told his mom, if he wakes up, give him something to drink, but for sure he's dead. But he was so close with the Prophet that the first thing he did when he opened his eyes, he goes, how is the Prophet? He didn't care about his injuries, about the fact that his face was so small. He goes, how was the Prophet? And he goes, I will not eat or drink until I see and make sure that he was okay. And when they took him to the Prophet the Prophet saw the way he was that he had to leave two ladies carried him there. And when the Prophet saw him, he felt like a little sad for his state and his condition. And Abu Bakr is like, don't worry, I'm okay, I'm fine. It's just a little bit bumps and bruises and that's it. But this was what they had. This is how they felt. The Prophet made them feel so special that he was walking with Abu Bakr, with Sayyidina Umar one day. And they were just walking. And the Prophet ﷺ held Umar's hand. And Umar felt so like happy, like he's like, you know what? I love you, man. Like, I just love you. And the Prophet ﷺ turned to him and he goes, you love me more than your family? He goes, yes. He goes, do you love me more than your money? He goes, yes. He goes, do you love me more than yourself? And Omar says, no. I love myself more. And the Prophet said, no, no. Your Iman is not complete unless, until you love me more than you love yourself. And Sayyidina Omar's son says that my dad left the group that was walking. And a few minutes later, he came back and said, now I love you more than myself. And the Prophet was so happy and smiled and said, now we have to love you. Now. Now your Iman is complete. And when his son asked him, like, how, how is it so easy for you to sit there and say, one minute you love him more than, you don't love him more than yourself, and the other minute you love him more than yourself. And he goes, I asked myself a question. Who do I need more? Me or him? And when I looked at myself, I was a nobody. I used to just herd sheep and pray to a statue of dates. And whenever I got hungry at night, I'd eat it. And then make it up again in the morning. So for me, I, if I rely on myself, I am nothing. But when the Prophet came, he guided me. And the only way that I can ascend through the heavens is through his love. And loving him. And following him. So I am in more need of him than I am of myself. Even the companions themselves loved one another. One guy, Sayyidina Umar was known to be very big and tall, right? And he was bald. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr was very skinny and had lots of hair. So one guy came to Umar and he said, you know what, what, what's better, to be bald or to have lots of hair? And the guy was telling him about who? About Abu Bakr, telling him, you know, are you better or is he better? And Umar said, no, he's better. He goes, one night of the nights of Abu Bakr are better than the whole lifetime of people of my life and the life of my family. He goes, I wish I was a hair on the chest of Abu Bakr from how great and that man was and the love that they had for one another. More examples or should we stop there? Oh, you have to eight, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Jazakallah khair. Inshallah, if I've said anything wrong, it's from myself. And if I've said anything good, it's from Allah. And uh, please forgive me for any shortcomings. Inshallah, if there's any questions or comments afterwards, please feel free to come by. And uh, that's it. Jazakallah khair.